The offices make and held are not the important thing. Today, politicians scramble to get into office so they can, can have honor and importance as well as money to flatter their vanity. But Macon, like Washington and Jefferson, was not important and respected because he was elected to office. He was elected to office because he was important and respected. He never campaigned for an office. He never attended a party caucus. He never promised anyone patronage to support him. Macon was elected over and over and revered for what he was. John Randolph of Roanoke, literally on his deathbed, referred to Macon as the wisest man he ever knew. Thomas Jefferson referred to him as the last of the Romans. And he meant that as a high compliment, that Macon was the model of a selfless patriot and principled Republican. In fact, Macon was more Jeffersonian than Jefferson himself. The American founders much admired the heroes of Republican Rome, which is why George Washington has a statue in a toga. Roman heroes like Cincinnatus, who was plowing his fields when they came to him and said the Republic was in peril. He left, took command of the army, defeated the enemy, and then returned to continue plowing his fields. He sought nothing for himself, only to serve his country and maintain, maintain its principles. This was a kind of Republican hero that Macon represented to Americans. He valued the respect of his countrymen, but had no ambition or for profit or glory himself. It was men ambitious for glory and profit who had subverted freedom throughout history. A negative opinion of Macon was expressed by President John Quincy Adams in his secret diary. He excoriated Macon for being responsible for defeating many of Adams' schemes for a stronger and more meddlesome federal government. Adams, in the typical Yankee way, thought Macon opposed him only because he was not as smart as Adams himself. This even was written in secret at the time Adams was trying to persuade Macon to be his vice president. Good Americans of the founding and for several generations thereafter praised the idea of Republican simplicity. A free government of the people did not need the fancy costumes and ceremonies of European courts. This is why Jefferson walked to his inauguration in a plain suit, delivered his State of the Union message in writing rather than preaching to the assembled congressmen like the monarch on the throne and made his White House social events as informal as possible. Here's something else important to note about early American history. Genuine Southern aristocrats like Jefferson and Macon believed in government responsible to the people. And uh, that sounds like it's working. The Northerners, who had no claim to aristocracy, wanted to use the government to aggrandize themselves. President John Adams rode in, around in a coach with white horses and insisted on being addressed as Your Excellency. When Macon was living at ease among his 70 slaves, John Adams was fortifying his house in fear that American mobs might attack him like they were doing in France. Of course, Macon, like all the other Jeffersonians, knew without a doubt that Northern attacks on slavery were malicious, counterproductive, and driven by lust for power rather than benevolence. And we all know that. Here is another interesting fact about the North and the South that never seems to get in history books. The history of the Revolution is written as if those who were fighting it were striving to achieve a strong central government for Americans. This is a lie promoted during the 19th century. It was true of some revolutionary soldiers like Hamilton and Marshall, but it was not true of John Taylor, James Monroe, and St. George Tucker of Virginia, Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina, Thomas Sumter and Andrew Pickens of South Carolina, or James Jackson of Georgia. These and many others had fought the revolution to get out from under a government that was levying taxes and sending troops and bureaucrats to restrict the liberty and prey upon the property of Americans. That those Americans did not want to establish a government that had too much power and was too remote from the people, even if it was an American government. And while New Englanders who had served three inactive months in the militia lined up to claim federal pensions for Revolutionary War service, the Southerners refused to accept money taxed from the people for doing their duty. Government had to be kept as close to the people as possible. North Carolina, in the beginning, elected the General Assembly anew each year, and the General Assembly chose the governor for a one-year term. Macon opposed the change to longer terms in the constitutional revision of 1835. You can imagine what he thought about the U.S. Senators serving six years and federal judges serving for life. These senators and judges were no longer responsible to the people. 
The officials had to be known to the people and reviewed frequently to make sure they were behaving and not exceeding their powers. Politics should not be a profession. Politicians should make their own living just like everyone else. They were citizens performing temporarily a service who would soon return to private life and live under the laws they had made. Macon owned much land and many slaves and was a national hero. Yet he lived very simply in a rather remote location, so remote that I, Clyde Wilson, confessed that I once spent half a day driving around Warren County in three different sets of directions and never found it. He attended the Baptist church accompanied by his slaves. He was very, very unostentatiously, and as far as I can find out, only one portrait was ever painted of him the one that was customarily made of speakers of the house. Nathaniel Macon summed up his philosophy and advice to a young Tar Heel. He said, quote, Remember you belong to a meek state and a just people who want nothing but to enjoy the fruits of their labor honestly and lay out the profits in their own way, unquote. By the end of his life, Macon had realized that the cause of republicanism was lost at the federal level and also that the North was determined to exploit and rule the South. South Carolina tried in 1832 to use nullification, state interposition, to force the federal government back within the limits of the Constitution. After he read Andrew Jackson's proclamations against South Carolina, Macon told his friends that it was too late for nullification. The Constitution was dead. 30 years later, in the spring of 1861, the North Carolina Convention met to unanimously ratify secession. Nathaniel Macon's son-in-law, Weldon N. Edwards, was in the president's chair. Nathaniel Macon left us an invaluable legacy from which we can learn much about the ways things should be in North Carolina. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll make copies of this and email them to anybody who wants them.